October 28th, 2023, Osaka. It's Game 1 of the Japan Series, the Nippon professional baseball equivalent of the World Series. Yoshinobu Yamamoto takes the bump for his Oryx Buffaloes, looking to repeat as MPB champs. Thanks to his 121 ERA, Yamamoto just won his third consecutive pitching triple crown, is about to win his third consecutive Pacific League MVP, and this might be his last game in Japan. If the series ends in 5 games or less, Yamamoto will not pitch again and he's planning on making the jump to MLB this offseason. He'll be Japan's greatest export since Mario Kart Wii. The last time a starting pitcher crossed the Pacific with close to this much hype was one decade ago, when Masahiro Tanaka went 24-0 before joining the Yankees. Yamamoto just finished with a lower ERA than Tanaka ever did, and he's about to obliterate Tanaka's international free agent contract record. But today, Yamamoto still has unfinished business with the Buffaloes. He's tasked with facing the Hanshin Tigers lineup that scored the most runs in MPB this year. Through four innings, he's in his usual form just one batter over the minimum. With the game unsurprisingly scoreless entering the fifth, the unthinkable happens. The very next inning, the impossible happens. Yamamoto hadn't allowed seven earned runs in a month since June of 2022. He just allowed seven in two innings during the biggest game of his season. Nobody in attendance saw this coming. The Buffaloes lost 8-0, but they picked up their ace with back-to-back -back wins in games 2 and 3. The Tigers struck back with consecutive wins of their own, meaning Yamamoto would start game 6 with his back against the wall. Coming off his worst start in over a year, international spotlight blaring, how did he respond? Save for a Sheldon noisy wall scraper, Yamamoto answered with one of the best outings of his career. 14 strikeouts, no walks, and 138 pitches for the complete game victory. Even though the Buffaloes lost game 7, his grand finale in front of his home nation's fans gave them something to remember him by. Yamamoto is closing out a historic chapter of his career, but most MLB fans are just about to meet him. A legend in his home country who has achieved everything there is to achieve in MPB, he's uprooting his life for a new challenge. MLB teams have had their eyes on him for years, and he's near the top of every free agent list for a league that he's never even pitched in. So, what exactly makes him so good? His mid-90s fastball, fall-off splitter, and knockout breaking ball pitch mix isn't too dissimilar from other Japanese stars like Tanaka or Shohei Otani, but the Yamamoto difference is his nearly impossible command. This is more of a surface level analysis of his repertoire, but for the purposes of this video, all you need to know is that Yamamoto thrives thanks to his over 50% ground ball rate, weak fly balls, and an incredible strikeout to walk ratio. His fastball shape makes it almost impossible to drive, which helps explain why he's only allowed a homer roughly every 30 innings over the last 3 seasons. He might have the best splitter in the world, and his curveball will generate a ton of whiffs against MLB's power swinging approach. If you want a deeper breakdown of his pitches, especially what makes Makes his splitter the best, check out Jolly Olive's video about Yamamoto here. His strikeout rate in MPB is similar to what Kodai Senga's was in Japan, and Senga just struck out nearly 11 batters per 9 as a rookie in MLB. Yamamoto will probably strike out over 10 batters per 9 and walk under 2, all while maintaining a well below average home run rate. At age 25, he's easily the safest and highest ceiling free agent starter on the market. What does that mean for him financially? Senga just got 5 years and 75 million dollars, and he's looking like a borderline top 10 starter in his own right, but his contract was capped by his age. Tanaka was also 25 when he came to the states, and he got 7 years and 155 million dollars. Tanaka pitched through injury with the Yankees, still totaling about 150 million dollars worth of wins above replacement production, and that's probably Yamamoto's floor. Most sources are mentioning the $200 million range for Yamamoto, and I think that's just where the bidding begins. In a league start for starting pitching, big market teams like the Dodgers, Yankees, Mets, Giants, Red Sox, Cubs, and more could push his market upwards of $250 or even $300 million, and that's not even including posting fees. I wouldn't be shocked if Yamamoto ends up in a New York borough on an 8 year deal at $32 million AAV. Provided he's healthy, it's almost impossible to overpay for Yoshinobu Yamamoto, and you should hope that your favorite team is putting competitive offers on his agent's desk 
all winter long. As this video's title suggests, Yamamoto is not alone. He's just one member of maybe the strongest professional international free agent class ever. A decent amount of MLB fans already know Yamamoto from the WBC, or just because his talent transcends continents. But the others on this list aren't nearly as well known. Another MPB pitcher and a KBO outfielder are also top 20 free agents right now. And a few more MPB arms are top 50. One of those pitchers might have the best lefty fastball on this planet. Not to be outdone, the Korean outfielder has the new coldest nickname in MLB, and I'll be covering all of them right after this. A day after Yamamoto put his stuff on display in the WBC semifinals, Shota Imanaga started the final for Samurai Japan. Most of the hype surrounding Japan's pitching staff was focused on Yamamoto, Phenom Roki Sasaki, and of course, Shohei Otani. And in that championship game, Otani threw the most memorable inning, but Imanaga started on the bump for a reason. The lefty led all WBC pitchers in stuff plus. Higher than Otani, higher than Yamamoto, higher than Sasaki, Lance Lynn, Jesus Lazardo, Sandy Alcantara, Hugh Darvish, Matt Harvey, everyone. A lot of you are probably thinking, what the hell is Stuff Plus? I'll give you the crash course. Pitching Plus, Stuff Plus, and Location Plus are three models devised by Eno Saris of The Athletic and others in an effort to isolate a pitcher's process as best as possible. Every stat has drawbacks. ERA, for example, is heavily influenced by defense, ballpark, run environment, and other factors outside of a pitcher's control. Location Plus only examines the resulting location, pitch type, and count to determine if a pitch was well located. Stuff Plus measures the physical characteristics of a pitch, including release point, velocity, spin rate, and horizontal and vertical movement. Essentially, Stuff Plus is a measure of how nasty a pitch is. Pitching Plus is a combined measure of the physical characteristics and resulting location to grade a pitcher's process, regardless of the result. All three of these stats are on a weighted scale where 100 is roughly average. Pause now if you want to take a look at standard deviations for Stuff Plus according to Fangraphs. Imanaga's Stuff Plus in the WBC was 130. His four-seam fastball had a Stuff Plus of 149. Why did the model love his pitch so much? Well, to put it bluntly, it's a riser. Imanaga's fastball averaged over 20 inches of induced vertical break in the WBC, meaning the spin he put on the ball resulted on it ending up 20 inches higher when it reached home than it would've without spin. The WBC is an incredibly small sample. Stuff Plus is a new stat that'll probably be tweaked in the future, and nobody with a girlfriend has ever heard of IVB, but Imanaka's numbers in MPB enforce the theory that his stuff is special. He struck out 29.2% of batters he faced this season, which is about 50% higher than MPB's average of 19.4%. If Imanaka's strikeout rate rises the same way Senga's did in his first Major League season, he'll strike out roughly 31% of batters he faces next year, which would place him in Cy Young Blake Snell's neighborhood in terms of strikeout stuff. But while Snell walks batters like it's going out of style, Imanaga walked just 4% of batters last year, giving him over 7 strikeouts per walk on the season. Some of you might be scratching your chins thinking about what you just heard. This guy has the best lefty fastball in the world, doesn't walk anyone, and strikes out the most batters in Japan. Oh yeah, he's also got a good split change and a put away slider, which I didn't even get to mention. Why is he being projected as a 3 or 4 starter when he does a lot of things even better than Yamamoto? Remember when I mentioned Yamamoto's over 50% ground ball rate? That's Imanaga's fly ball rate. He allows a gaudy amount of fly balls, and his fly ball rate has risen every year since 2020. Even in MPB, a league where homers are about half as common as Major League Baseball, Imanaga allowed a homer about once every 9 innings. Thanks to his strikeout and walk rates, a lot of the homers he gives up will be solo shots, but they'll be homers nonetheless, and there will be a lot of them. I think of Imanaga as a more extreme Andrew Heaney, a similar but better lefty fastball, a similar but better strikeout stuff, and a similar but more dangerous tendency to get barreled up. If a team figures out sequencing that can keep the ball in the park as much as possible, Imanaga might be the most underpaid starter in baseball next year. And even if the homers are as serious of a concern as I imagine, his other qualities are valuable enough to be a solid mid-rotation arm. Because he's got an unsteady floor and is entering his age 30 season, I imagine he'll get a similar contract to Senga. The official and that's baseball prediction is 5 years and 90 million dollars to the Dodgers. Just like they did with Heaney, if anyone can maximize Imanaga's skill set while minimizing his weaknesses, it's LA. 
Up next, I'll briefly tell you about a few more notable MPB pitchers. I'll start off with Yariel Rodriguez. As you may have noticed, this man is not Japanese. He's Cuban. In 2020, in accordance with MPB's pipeline agreement with Cuba, Rodriguez signed with the Junichi Dragons. And in 2022, he broke out as a reliever. His solid strikeout to walk ratio, great ground ball rate, and no homers allowed made him an incredibly valuable asset in high leverage situations. After coming up as a starter, he returned to the role for Team Cuba during the WBC this year. Across his two starts, he pitched seven and a third innings, struck out 10, and only allowed two runs. But he did walk six batters and hit two. Command has always been a big issue for him as a starter. During his time in Cuba, he walked nearly five batters per nine, and his walk rate was out of control in 2021 while starting for the Dragons. Regardless, Rodriguez's stuff generated big league intrigue during the WBC. His fastball sat around 95 miles per hour, even getting up to 98, and his slider reached over 3,000 RPMs while sitting in the mid 80s. The caveat is that he threw these two pitches over 90% of the time. Looking at his track record and his stuff, it would be a serious gamble to try to make him major league starter, but he's probably a very good major league reliever right now. After his impressive WBC, he failed to report to the Dragons for the MPB season, officially defecting from Cuba and moving to the DR to train for a major league contract. My official prediction is that Rodriguez signs with the Houston Astros for 4 years and $40 million guaranteed. Yuki Matsui is another very good reliever that should translate well in MLB, and now Yuki Uesawa will probably sign as an innings eating starter. I personally think that Uesawa's low 90s fastball won't play in MLB, but Matsui will help any MLB bullpen today. Besides that, I don't have too much to say about these guys. Check out Yaku Cosmopolitan's video here for more information about them, as well as more in-depth breakdowns about the other MPB pitchers I've discussed. Before we get to our last and most dynamic player, if you've enjoyed so far, please subscribe. Over 90% of you aren't subscribed. It's free, only takes a click, and helps me out a ton. Plus, you won't miss out on any of my future uploads. Thanks! Last, but definitely not least, we have our first position player on this list as well as our first non-MPB player. Jung Hoo Lee just finished his seventh season of stellar play for the Kiwoom Heroes of the KBO. As I teased earlier, the second he signs with the Major League team, he will have the best nickname in MLB. Here's some backstory. Lee's father, Jung Byung, played 19 professional seasons in the KBO and MPB, accumulating over 2,000 hits and 500 steals. He was an all-star nearly every season of his KBO career, won Korean Series MVP as a rookie, hit 393 and stole 84 bases in 1994 and went 30 60 in 1997. He's a beloved figure in the Korean baseball world, capturing the hearts of fans thanks to his incredible speed in the outfield and on the bases. He was so fast that he became known as Son of the Wind. Being his son and also a baseball phenom, Jung Hoo quickly became known as Grandson of the Wind. While he didn't quite inherit his father's game-breaking speed on the bases, topping out at 13 steals in 2019, bat control definitely runs in the family. Lee hit 324 and got on base nearly 40% of the time as an 18-year-old rookie in 2017. His worst strikeout rate came in 2018 at just 11.2%, and it's been less than half that in recent seasons. He's also drawn more walks with age, walking more than twice as often as striking out over the last two years. Lee had a monster 2022 season, finishing with a 175 WRC plus and the best power numbers of his career. He won KBO MVP and soon after expressed interest on making the leap across the Pacific. With the international spotlight on him, 2023 didn't quite go as planned. South Korea was eliminated in the group stage of the WBC in quite embarrassing fashion, falling to Australia and then Japan. The offense was not to blame, especially Lee, who tallied 6 hits and 2 walks and 16 at-bats, but most Americans didn't get to see him play during the odd hours at the Tokyo Dome. His KBO season was also relatively disappointing, as he had his worst power hitting season since 2019 and missed most of the second half recovering from an ankle surgery. Even though he would have liked to have a year like his 2022 entering free agency, I don't think his down year hurts his value too much. Teams already knew that his home run power probably wasn't going to translate in MLB parks, regardless of his 2022 home run total. He's an intriguing player because of his hit tool, discipline, and defense, and he's never wavered on any of those fronts. Lee won a gold glove in the outfield every year from 2018 to 2022, and he should be able to man center field at at least an average level, which is incredibly valuable on its own. Although far from a perfect comp, one player we can look to who made this jump is Lee's former teammate, Ha Sung Kim. Kim displayed more power and walks in Korea, but doesn't have a 70 grade hit tool like Lee. 
It took a couple of years to adjust, but Kim has proven to be an above average bat, an elite middle infield defender in MLB. Teams right now are probably asking themselves if Lee's bat to ball skills will be enough to maintain an on base percentage north of 350. If so, he'll easily exceed his contract value. His outfield defense and hitting skill set immediately make me think Stephen Kwan. The biggest concern I have with Lee is his ground ball rate being near 60% which would place him only behind Tim Anderson out of qualified major leaguers this past year. Regardless, his defense in the outfield gives him a high enough floor for teams to gamble on. Seeing how well Kim turned out after a year of adjustment, Lee will probably get much more on his initial deal. I'll give him to the Red Sox at 5 years and $65 million. That big right field will let him pepper base hits in front of outfielders and extra base hits down the line. I expect major league contributions from all these players, even if some need to make some adjustments. Lee is a potential leadoff bat and gold glove outfielder. Rodriguez can develop into an elite reliever or solid back end starter. Imanaga's got the ceiling of a top 5 strikeout starter in baseball. And Yamamoto is as close to a sure thing as a pitcher can be. Since they're all free agents, contending teams will be making runs at them, so they all have a chance to make a playoff impact as soon as next year. I'm excited to see what they can do in the states, and you should be too. If these guys are wrecking games and in rookie of the year conversations in 2024, don't say I didn't warn you.